Welcome. Thank you for joining us for First Person Conversations with Holocaust Survivors. My name is Bill Benson. I have hosted the museum's First Person program since it began 22 years ago. Each month, we bring you firsthand accounts of survival of the Holocaust. We are honored to have Holocaust survivor Louisa Lawrence Israels share her first her personal firsthand account of the Holocaust with us. Louisa, thank you so much for agreeing to be our first person today. It's my pleasure, Bill, and I'm very happy with, to be with all of you this afternoon. Louisa, you have so much to share with us in our short one hour, so we'll go ahead and get started. Before you tell us what happened to you and your family during World War II and the Holocaust, tell us about your parents and their life in the Netherlands before the war began. Before uh, the war began, my parents lived in Amsterdam. My father worked with his father in the family textile business. They manufactured clothing, they imported clothing, and they had a chain of stores where they sold what they manufactured. My mom was an artist and a fashion designer, and they were very happy together till my father was uh, mobilized in 1939. Louisa, did you did you have a large extended family? Um, ex yes, extended family. The immediate family wasn't that large, but there were many, many cousins and second cousins and third cousins. Yes, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and 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 grandparents at that time were still alive. Yes, all four. Okay. You you mentioned your father being mobilized into the Dutch army, which happened in nineteen thirty nine. And then, of course, Germany invaded and occupied the Netherlands in May 1940. Tell us what you know about your father's experience in the Dutch army. So my father was a reserve officer and was caught up pretty fast during the call up of um, every uh, Dutch man above the age of 18. He was stationed in the southern part of Holland, most southern town of Maastricht, and he was part of an engineering battalion. And they were planning to uh, blow up the bridges over the Meuse River, what is a natural border between Germany and the Netherlands, and to try to prevent the Nazis from coming into Holland in mm -hmm. case they were going to come in. My parents had planned to move together to Maastricht. They found a little house. My mom started making uh, drapes and curtains, but it, uh, she never moved because um, in, in the first week of um, May uh, 1940, my father called her just a week that she was supposed to join him. He said, you can't come. Couldn't say why. Um, but my mom figured out that an, an invasion by the Germans would be imminent, and mm -hmm. it was, because they came into the Netherlands in 1940. And Louisa, after they came into the Netherlands and occupied your country, um, they passed a number of anti-Semitic uh, laws um, soon after the occupation. Will you tell us about some of those laws? Right. So Jews had lived in the Netherlands for more than 500 years. They were integrated in the country. There was no anti-Semitism at that time. Um, they just lived either their own life or they lived a life in the Netherlands. And all of it, and it was, I always say it was a big life and that mm -hmm. life became uh, slowly smaller and smaller. It, it was very gradual. Um, f what happened to my family is that the family business was confiscated because it was a Jewish business and Jews were not allowed to have a business. Then um, the orders came that you had to hand over your valuables because you were not allowed to uh, have valuables like cash, uh, savings books, gold, silver, jewelry, copper, tin, bicycles, radios, cameras, anything that was of value you had to hand in. When you handed your stuff in, you did get a, a receipt and they said it was just for safekeeping. But I'm here to tell you that anybody that survived the war mm -hmm. never saw their stuff again because it never stayed in Holland, went straight to Germany. Um, then also, um, Jews are not allowed to use any public transportation. Jewish children are not allowed to go to uh, public schools. Um, you had to be treated by a Jewish doctor and non-Jewish doctor could not treat a Jew. 
if you were sick, you had to go to a um, Jewish hospital if you had to be hospitalized. Um, so life really became smaller and smaller. At some point, your parents uh, then moved to a town called Harlem, west of Amsterdam, where you were born. Tell us about Harlem, if you don't mind. Right. So I don't remember very much about Harlem. I know now that it's a very lovely town. Harlem had a good-sized Jewish community. So the largest Jewish, Jewish community was in Amsterdam. But Harlem had a really good size. They had a synagogue. They had two rabbis. You could buy kosher food. And my parents found a small house on a very quiet uh, street, and they rented the house. So my father, my mother, and my two-year-older brother. And I was born in that house. And we lived there for another six months till we had to, what the Germans called, evacuate to uh, answer them. Mm -hmm. and, and here, of course, I think we see a, a, a photo photograph of Harlem. Shortly before you were born in July 1942, the Germans began systematically deporting Jews from the Netherlands to killing centers in German-occupied Poland. Life also became more restrictive uh, for Dutch Jews when they were forced to identify themselves with a yellow Star of David badge. Will you tell us what this was like for Jews, including your parents, to have to, to wear this? So in the Netherlands, the Yellow Star uh, orders for Jews above the age of six in the Netherlands came just around the time that I was born and around the time that the trains deporting Jews to the death camps in Poland had started to run. So... There's always a question. So why? So you were ordered to wear a star. Why did people really do it? Um, it singled you out. People might have known that you were Jewish, but like I said before, in Holland, it was not such a big thing. Religion, no matter what kind of religion, what religion you had, was accepted. But now, all of a sudden, you wear your religion on your chest, and you couldn't really leave your house without uh, this star sewn on your clothing. Um, the problem for not about not wearing it was that you didn't know at that time who you could trust. Mm -hmm. There was an incentive to turn in Jews for the collaborators. So if some if you had a neighbor that you were friendly with and that you said hello with every morning, um, and he knew he or she knew that you were Jewish, but that person could have turned collaborator. And if that person saw you walk outside without a star. They could turn you in and they would get actually money for it. Money for it. Mm -hmm. Yes. You know, the, the Nazis heaped, of course, abuses large and small constantly. And one of the ones that you shared with me was that you, you had a very limited ration to get textiles, fabrics for clothing. And yet you were forced to use that ration to purchase the yellow star to sew on your, your own clothing. That's correct. Your family was close with another Jewish family who lived on your street in Harlem. Will you tell us about them? Right. It was a very exceptional family. Um, they lived uh, all together. The, the father of the family was the president of the uh, Jewish congregation. Um, you can see here, before the war, how people lived. They worked hard, but they also went on vacation. The father of the, uh, of the family across the street from us, you see him here in the middle. And uh, one of the daughters in the front, uh, her name was Selma, and she became a very good friend of my mom's. And Selma's mom is right behind her. So this family lived in their house with their five children, and their two adopted uh, cousins, so there were seven children in the house. All the children were about my mom's uh, and dad's age, around 30. They were, none of them were married. Some of them were engaged. Mm -hmm. Also, a, um, uh, the father's parents lived in the house and two unmarried aunts. They were very religious. They, um, they pulled their ration coupons for food every week. Um, because all food for all Dutch people was rationed. And they cooked every Friday night a Shabbat meal. My parents were very often invited, as often as they wanted to go. Uh, they could cross the street, and they loved it. 
and they celebrated Shabbat, uh, the Jewish holiday that comes back every week. Um, it starts at sundown on Friday night. And they were very friendly. Louisa, tell us what happened in January 1943 that had a major impact on your community and your family. Right. So I have to track back a little bit about Selma. Selma was my mom's friend. Selma had been a teacher and she was fired because she was Jewish. Mm -hmm. So to have something to do, she used to come over to our house just across the street quite often and help my mom with her two little children. Um, after the war, she be actually became my best friend, a mm -hmm. um, wonderful person. So in um, January 1943, the underground, the resistance, and I call them uh, heroes because they all risked their lives to help people that needed help. They worked against the occupying Nazis, but they got very organized. Since uh, deportations had started, they tried to do anything in their power to sabotage um, any of the Nazi rules or things that they were doing. Um, they had also, um, towards the end of January, shot one of the German um, sergeants. And as a, a form of reprisal, they uh, Nazis, occupying Nazis, took. 10 of the most prominent Jewish men. Selma's dad was one of them. And so was the rabbi. And you see the rabbi here on the left. And Selma's dad is a third from the left. And they shot them in front of the population. They also took another, about 104 Jewish men and sent them to a concentration camp in the Netherlands. And from there, they were deported to uh, death camps in Poland. So every man we see here was, was executed. That's correct. Along with another 100 plus people at that time. Tell us then what happened to the rest of that wonderful family that you described to us that lived right. across the street. So also around that same time, all Jews in our area, the coastal area, got orders to move to Amsterdam. The Germans tried to make it easier on themselves and have Jewish, Jews concentrated in Amsterdam and then they all they had to do was pick them up and, and deport them from there. So they wanted to make that whole coastal area uh, what they called Judenrein, what means free of Jews. So after Selma's dad was um, murdered, she was again in our house and she heard a lot of noise across the street. Uh, this was a couple of days after her father was murdered. And she looked out of the window and she saw a large truck it had stopped in front of her house and some screaming people jumped off. They kicked in her door and they rounded up all her family members that were left in the house, of course, except for herself and her um, father who was already murdered. Two of her brothers escaped through the backyard, but one of the brothers had promised um, his father that he would take care of, uh, of the mother and he, from his being, from having escaped, he actually came back. So he was also pushed onto the truck. The truck drove away and his family was deported to uh, Auschwitz, one of the death camps where they were murdered. So Selma and her brother were the only ones that eventually uh, survived. Um, and, and Selma witnessed that, that take, taking place from your home. Correct. Where, where did your family, and including Selma now, where did your family and Selma go when you arrived in Amsterdam? Right. So my father was so scared after this happened to Selma's family that he figured that same night we had to move to Amsterdam. He had waited with uh, about, about moving, but he figured we had to get out of there. And we moved in temporarily with one of my father's trusted um, resistance friends, in a small apartment. So it was my mom, my dad, my brother, and myself. I was six months old at the time. And our friend Selma, who stayed with us during that, uh, the rest of the war, most of the time. And my father went out um, to look for a place to hide. He knew that he could not live in the open anymore. And he was very lucky. He had studied in Amsterdam. His headquarters, the family headquarters was in Amsterdam and he knew Amsterdam really well. He had trusted friends 
um, that, that at least uh, it showed that he could trust them. They had not turned to collaborator because they helped us. Mm -hmm. And he found a um, more permanent place in a storage attic in uh, part of an Amsterdam row house. Mm -hmm. The, the 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 resistance uh, the the heroes that you've mentioned um, they were obviously a huge factor in your in your survival. Tell us what actions that they were taking to try to slow the deportation of Jews from the Netherlands. One of the very important things that they did is they realized how easy it was for the Nazis to find out where Jews lived. We had this amazing. Uh, registration system really thanks to Napoleon so many hundred years before um, when you were born within 24 hours your father had to register your birth your, your name your first name your last name um, your address and your religion so all the, the Nazis had to do is go to a, a registration office and they knew where they could find where Jews lived so to make that hard on them um, the uh, resistance bombed these registration offices. And you can see what the results are of one of those bombings in Amsterdam. And then they burned the registration cards. You can imagine that the, if this was done, that the Nazis were very angry. So reprisals were left and right. And they tried to find the people that actually did it, but didn't always work. But then they took somebody else and killed them or sent them on an early transport to a concentration camp. Oh, I can only imagine that the retaliations were, were beyond brutal. Right. And, 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 and what we're looking at here then is like hundreds, if not thousands of file cabinets and um, the, 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 the cards stored in there all destroyed in this right. image. But it's pre, pre um, uh, computer time. Yes, so indeed. Everything yes, was indeed. on little cards, yeah. Louisa, your your father was able to manage to get um, false identity papers for the family. Will you tell us about that? Right. So that was this was another thing that the uh, was organized through the resistance. They found a specialist who could work with different chemicals, and they were able to uh, make a false identity papers because everybody had to walk around with an identity card. And for Jews, there was always a letter J written in it. So it was important to have a different name, but also not with that J. Um, it was very difficult to do. It's not like anything that people can do today. If mm -hmm. I see a fake identity card today, I have no idea what the difference is between real mm -hmm. and a fake one. But at that time, it was difficult. You had to take the old card, use chemicals, and erase certain things. But you had to leave certain stamps to make it real. Um, so it was a lot of work, and people did it. And we got fake identity papers. Um, my brother and my name was on my mom's card. Uh, and my name became Maria. That you're supposed to have a family name. I had no idea. I was too young. And my parents never told my brother and myself our real names. This is all for safekeeping. So until after the war, you, you only knew yourself as Maria. That's correct. Yeah. The uh, You mentioned that your father was able, with the help of the underground, he was able to find uh, a permanent hiding place. Will, will you tell us more about that? And I think we have an image. Right. So this is a uh, an Amsterdam row house. These uh, houses are more than 700 years old, but are very well kept up. So it still looks exactly the same. And you see a little indicator that points to the top part. So there, that's where the storage attics are. It's a little different than what most people expect. The storage attic has its own walk up. So its own entrance and its own four flights of stairs. And you can rent space. So it's owned by a different person than the people that necessarily live in the mm -hmm. apartments. So my father was able to rent that. He paid 10 years of rent. He still had that kind of money uh, with the help of his father. And he figured going out every month at a certain time to pay the rent would probably be dangerous. The landlord, I have no idea who he was. He must have been a good person. He never questioned it. He took the 10 years and he left us alone. So, 10 years, so your father anticipated that you might need that for that long of a period. I had no idea. It could be a week, it could be a year, it could be two years. He just it could didn't. Be 10 know. years, yeah. yeah. 
and tell us some, I'm just looking at that picture, realizing that that you, that's four stories up. That's where your, your attic space was. Tell us about the attic space. What was it like uh, for you and your family? Tell us about moving in there, what you know about it. All right. So it was a rough uh, place right underneath the roof. It's not very well insulated. So it was really very cold in the winter time. Um, these storage attics had a, a toilet with a toilet that you could actually flush. It had a small sink with cold running water. There was no kitchen, no bathroom with a tub or a shower. And there were already a couple of things stored in that attic. There was a table and chairs. There was a, a couch that was actually a broken down couch, but for my brother and myself, it was wonderful. We could jump on it. It was really one of the very few things that we could do. Um, it had a dormer window. And there was also a cupboard with some things stored in it. So it was very important to figure out and to discuss before going in what we would need right away. So with the help of the underground, my father had stored some of his, uh, my parents' stuff with a, a trusted friend, again, from the resistance. Um, but we were able to borrow mattresses. So they took in four mattresses. So for my mom, my dad, Selma, and my brother, a crib for me, as many uh, warm blankets and warm clothing as they could get. Uh, they took in some food supplies. Uh, my mom took in a camping stove because there's no kitchen. So if there's anything to cook or water to boil, had to be done on a camping stove and she took in some oil lamps just in case the electricity would go off mm. my father also thought ahead because he thought that i'm going in with these two little kids so he brought in a lot of scrap paper and a lot of color pencils and crayons tell us what you can about what what your family's life was like then in the attic and in the circumstances that you just described so i was six months and I could only crawl at that time. So, but I, I, I was very alert and I saw that most of the time, um, mom and dad, Salma and my brother were sitting around the table. Uh, here you see me on the broken down couch. I love to sit on it because it's mm -hmm. nice and soft. Mm -hmm. And you also see that I really have very pretty clothing on. That was because mom and Selma were always sewing, sitting around the table. They were mending clothes, cutting up some of their old clothes, making new clothes. I did not have shoes. I had booties because by the time I started walking and my mom couldn't take me to a shoe store if there were still shoes to be found because we never went outside. The only person that went out was my dad to try to get food, medicine or whatever else we needed. Um, so I saw them sitting around the table most of the time, mom and dad, Selma sewing, but they were also playing games with my brother. And I learned uh, as soon as I started walking and talking and I could sit with them that they, uh, the games were really fun. But what were they doing? They were teaching my brother color and later on me too. We played games with colors. Um, they taught us letters and words and numbers and easy math. It was a form of homeschooling. It was mm. clever to do that because um, it was a form of schooling, but it was a way of keeping us busy. And we didn't know that it was actually a, a form of homeschooling. We just thought that they were paying attention to us, what they were, and that they were playing with us. Before the war, uh, Louisa, your father had been an avid collector of art and, and other objects. How important was that to your survival? It was very important because my father used his art, and this was not Rembrandt or Picasso. This was uh, small artifacts that were actually stored by one of his friends. So he needed to buy food for us or medicine. We had no income. So he was able to barter for the things that we needed by trading his artifacts. And he more or less used everything that he had. There was very little left after the war. So in other, again, that is very lucky that he mm -hmm. just had enough. It wasn't always enough. Like if he wanted a whole loaf of bread, maybe 
a, a little bowl would give him six slices. So it was never what he thought that it would be a lot of stuff, but it was just enough to keep us from actually starving. And and to use those items, it meant, as you described a little while ago, he had to leave the attic. He had to venture out at great risk to get to get the basics, the, the some food to eat, probably some fuel for the little uh, camp stove that you had, and certainly if you ever needed medicine. So t- tremendous risks for him to go out there. It was, but I don't think he thought about it because this was survival. So the rest of us did not go out. He did. And sometimes he was actually warned uh, because he always made contact with, um, we had three people in the resistance that kind of took care of us. Uh, two of them survived. One of them did not. Was One of them was betrayed. The uh, resistance, when they got organized, they had a special system. So um, he, he was sometimes warned. Um, you're planning to go out next Monday. Don't go out because we're expecting something. Mm. Something was always a roundup in the area or it was too dangerous to go out. If he hadn't been out for a while, um, one of these three people from the resistance used to come and visit us. They were the only people who knew where we were. Um, Even relatives had no idea where we are. When you were in hiding, you don't exist anymore. And nobody should know where you are. Um, so they would come and see, first of all, if you were still there, we could have been betrayed and then always how they could help. Mm. Pretty amazing heroes. They sure sounded, they sure sounded, Louisa. Despite the difficulties of living in the attic, as you've described to us so far in July, 1944, your family decided to have a celebration. So, uh, you have to tell us about what they were celebrating. Right. So. Again, backtracking a little bit, um, my parents were really amazing people. And of course, you always discover that when you're getting a little older, not right in the middle of, of, of our, our uh, occupation and hiding time. But they, uh, they had one thought during that time of um, hiding, and that was to try to keep their children safe. They wanted the children for the children to stay together and have a life. Um, and they tried anything. Um, and one of, of, of the, the things that they did is they never talked to us about the outside world. They didn't tell us that our country was occupied. They didn't tell us that we were persecuted because we were Jews. Uh, they didn't tell us anything. That we were hungry and that we were cold in the winter. They didn't, never made a big deal out of it. Um, we as children always got something to eat before we went to sleep. Sometimes we shared a cracker because there was not more, but they, our parents always saved something for the children, it was always about the children. Mm-hmm. So my father had gone out again in June 1944, and when he came back, his face looked different. I guess my parents always looked worried, but I didn't know my parents different. That was also normal for my brother and myself. But my brother said, Papa, you look different, what happened? And my father tried to explain what my brother and I, of course, did not understand because we didn't know what was going on on the outside. But my father explained to mom and Selma that he had heard from the resistance that the Allied army had landed in Normandy, northern France. Here you see one of the landings. And he became more hopeful. He said, so there is help on the way. When that will come, we don't know. But I'm hopeful that we might make it because if... He worried, um, or the adults worried, every hour of the day, every minute of the day, because we could have been betrayed. And betrayal would mean deportation to a death camp. Right. And the image that we see here are uh, American troops landing at uh, Omaha Beach, June 6, 1944. So on, so on top of celebrating uh, the Normandy invasion and the hope that that would bring liberation soon, it was also your birthday. Right. My birthday was a couple of weeks later and my father picked that day. He said, we need to celebrate this moment of 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 um, help on the way. And they had to really organize this because they couldn't go to a store like today. You can organize a birthday party within a day or really a couple of hours. But that took a while. So mom cut up an old blouse and made a beautiful dress for me. Uh, Selma from Old Rags made a doll, like a Raggedy Ann doll. That was my first doll I was going to get. Um, 
my brother had only one toy when we went into hiding. He was two years old and he was allowed to bring one toy. And he brought a little wooden pull horse. I was allowed to look at it, but I was not allowed to play with it. It was his toy. So he wrapped it and he was going to give it to me on my birthday. Um, my father also talked to one of his friends and um, his friend said, I'm going to come over on the birthday. And he brought over socks and shoes that I didn't have. Shoes were a little bit too small, but for the picture, they put them on my feet. He brought a, a little wicker chair, a doll's chair. He said she's going to get a doll. Now she can play house. So it was really a fantastic birthday. My best gift when I opened it was my brother's story because I thought, hmm, now it's going to be mine. Except he told me it was just for the day and I had to give it back at night. But at least it was mine for the day. It was fine. I saw the chair and it was little. There's a doll's chair, but I was little uh, and I could sit in it. So here I'm sitting uh, on this chair. But this picture that I got after the war um, because my father's friend took the camera and the film with him and said, if she survives, she'll get the picture. And I also realized it's a tribute to my parents mm -hmm. because you see a perfectly normal little two-year-old without a worry in the world because my parents didn't want us to grow up worried. They never told us what was happening and they never told us about their relatives they were worried about and all their worries. So I'm perfectly happy, and that's really a tribute to my parents. And and that's such a, an incredible photograph in, in so many ways, but you're wearing that special dress that your mom made for you for your birthday. You're holding the doll that I believe Selma made for you, and you've got your brother's toy for the day that's yours at your feet and uh, and the shoes and socks. That's an incredible photograph. So And you're sitting on the little wicker chair, so let's let's see that. So this is the wicker chair, which was really one of our very few toys. And it's very beautiful. It was 150 years old. It was already an antique, uh, of course, by the time I got it. And now it's uh, way older because that's over 80 years ago. Um, it's 78 years ago. So um, um, we used, we were rough with this chair. We stood on it. We threw it at each other when we were angry. And um, but it survived, and of course, it was pretty uh, damaged after liberation. And you can see a lighter area on the bottom where my mom had the chair restored. Mm -hmm. It stayed with us during uh, our when our children grew up, and but it's it was fragile, and I, you always had to have a lot of room around it. And I asked the, one of our daughters if they wanted it, and they said, No, mom then we have to be careful with it. So I said, well, what if we donate it to the Holocaust Museum in Washington? And they said, that's a good idea. So that's where it is now. They stabilized it and they take good care of it. And once in a while they show it. And sometimes it's on the, in the permanent exhibit. And um, we're all very happy that the museum has it now. In late 1944, Allied forces made their way to the Netherlands in the hope of liberating your country but they were forced to stop short. Will you tell us why they stopped? What stopped them uh, from reaching Amsterdam and, and being able to liberate you at that time? So the country south of the Netherlands is Belgium. And when the Allied army uh, liberated Western Belgium and they crossed the border into the Netherlands, one third of the Netherlands is separated from two thirds, the Northern part by three rivers, large rivers that run hor uh, horizontal. Uh, they really uh, cut the, the country. And the largest river is the Rhine River that most people know about. So when the Allies came to the rivers and they had liberated the southern part of Holland, they realized that we had an early onset of a very severe uh, winter, 1944-1945, in Northern Europe, that they didn't have the right equipment to cross three rivers. So they left the Canadian part of the Allied Army, Canadian Army, camped by the rivers, and they, they were told when the rivers thaw in the spring, liberate the rest of the Netherlands. And the rest of the Allied Army went into liberated eastern um, Belgium and into Germany. So the southern part 
of, of the Netherlands. People are dancing in the streets. Supply lines are coming through. No more ration. or There was still ration. But, I mean, there, there is food, at least, that they can buy with their rations. Um, they can sing uh, in the street. They can wave Dutch flags. And they're happy. And then we in the north have another eight months of um, a terrible winter. We actually called it the hunger winter. Uh, it's for all Dutch people, not just for people in, in hiding. Um, supply lines are closed off by the Nazis. Uh, winter crops are frozen because the winter started way too early. And we have eight more uh, months of uh, uh, Nazi occupation. How do you think your parents were able to get you through that terrible winter of 1944 to 1945? Yeah, I, I have very vivid memories because we were hungry. But my father had emergency food when he found out that the um, southern part was liberated. He was able to trade a lot of his things for a lot of butter, uh, sugar and flour. And he baked cookies that he uh, sealed in tins that he had uh, gotten from uh, his friends. And that was emergency food. There was so much butter in those cookies that it would keep you for a little while. Mm -hmm. uh, but I do remember being hungry and, and getting to, to eat things that made us really sick because they were not really edible, like uh, uh, tulip bulbs. But the other memory is that we were so cold that, by, that we developed uh, chillblains on our hands and feet. Chillblains are very, very painful, and that's caused by cold, the cold. And it still exists today, but you can get a cream for it. And a cream existed at that time, but it was nowhere to be found. Mm -hmm. um, we cried, my brother and I, we were in so much pain. So my father remembered that farmers um, in the 1930s, when they had to feed their livestock in the wintertime, they also had chillblains because it was so cold outside. And they um, knew exactly what to do. They put their hands and feet in cow or a horse's urine, and the uric acid in the urine it's the same thing that's actually in the cream that will take care of the pain. We didn't have horses or cows, of course, upstairs. And my father made us pee in a potty before we went to sleep and put our hands and feet in our own pee pee. Um, we did not know it was yucky or disgusting. Uh, all we knew is that the pain would go away. We could fall asleep without pain. So we were fine with that. And, and that's a memory that you still have to this day doing yeah. that. Finally, on May 5th, 1945, Canadian forces liberated Amsterdam. You were three years old at the time. Tell us what you know about what it was like to come out of hiding for you and your family in Selma after all that time. When my father heard all the noise on the street, he actually uh, pulled a chair uh, next to the dormer window. He opened the window and he looked out and he said, I think it's over. Well, we didn't know what was, what was over because we didn't know what was going on. But miraculously, he had one tin of cookies left and he was hungry. So he stuffed his face and put the tin on the table and told us we could all take a cookie, a whole cookie. We'd only shared a cookie before. So my brother said, oh, that, that is what it means. Being free means eating cookies. We had no concept. So after a few days, my parents wanted to be absolutely sure that it was safe. My father said, we're going outside. So my brother and I, holding on to each other for dear life, followed my father uh, four flights of stairs. My father opened the front door. It was a beautiful, uh, sunny spring day, and the sun blinded us. We walked onto the street, and we looked left and right. It was very strange for us, and we were scared. We didn't know what a street was. We thought if you walk to, we, we lived in the middle of the block, but if you walk to either side of the street, you will fall off the street. We didn't know that the street goes into another street or into a square. We were just afraid. My brother started crying. I mimicked everything he did. And I cried to him. He, my brother said, I don't want to be free like this. And I want to go back upstairs. Mm -hmm. So it was a tough thing for my parents because they had succeeded. They had no idea what had happened to any of their relatives because communications were not uh, there yet. It took a long time. But they have saved their children, and then the children don't want it. Mm -hmm. So they took us back upstairs, explained, ex also explained that uh, my real name was Louisa, so from then on, no more Maria. 
And after a couple of days, I said, we're going out for a walk. So we walk outside again, again, crying, holding on to each other, my brother and I. And we see all these people on the streets. My parents took us to the end of the street. They took us to a square. And people were celebrating freedom. They were climbing on Canadian uh, military vehicles. They, they were just happy. Uh, everybody is wearing rags because nobody was able to go to a store and buy new clothes if they were even in the in the stores. Um, and um, so Canadian soldiers were mingling with Dutch people and talking to them. And then they see these two kids crying. So they came over to us. I have no idea what they were saying. I didn't speak uh, English. But they gave each, my brother and I, a Hershey bar. And my mom said we could taste the chocolate. You have no idea. The first time you taste chocolate is magic. We couldn't finish the bar because our stomachs were so little. Mm -hmm. We took the rest home. But the next morning, my brother wakes up. He jumps off his mattress and he screams, can we go outside again? He wanted more Hershey bars. So that shows you how resilient children are. No more crying Hershey bars. So at that point, you were able to begin to sort of normalize life outside right. uh, in the world. What did your family do following the war? Where did you live? So we went to the country as soon as my parents could. And then um, my father had a friend in Sweden. Sweden had been neutral in Stockholm and who came over uh, maybe two months after liberation and he offered my dad a job because there was no job for my father anymore. The business was really worked into the ground. All the machinery and everything was sent to Germany. Uh, there were just four walls left. Um, so we needed, my father needed a job. Uh, my mom, of course, was pregnant again. And my parents had three more children after the war. And um, so we moved to Sweden for a couple of years. Just before we, my father went first. So the first month that we lived in um, in the country, um, my parents had enrolled my brother and I in a Montessori school system where everybody is not on the same page. We were so far ahead in certain things and so far behind in other things. Mm -hmm. And we lived in Sweden for um, two years. Um, my father was asked by the Dutch government to come back and restart his business. So we moved back to Holland in 1948. And we, my brother and I uh, went back to the Montessori school. We stayed there for the whole grammar school. Uh, and that really was a very good thing for us. Um, my, the rest of my siblings followed. We all went to the same school. Mm -hmm. um, and um, uh, my father was able, with the help of the Marshall Plan, uh, monetary help, like a loan, uh, to restart his business. It, it took five years of very hard work. In 1953, the business became profitable again. Louisa, what, at what age do you think, do you recall that you began to understand the enormity of what had happened during the Holocaust? And what was the impact on you when you, when you finally had that realization of what it really was about? Right. So I knew that we were different. I knew different things that happened to us, but my parents didn't want to talk about it. I did ask my friend Selma for some things, but I realized what the Nazis had done to Jews um, when I started working as a physical therapist in Amsterdam. I joined a large practice and a lot of my patients were um, uh, camp survivors that had all kinds of ailments, most of them caused by being in, in the camp and the hard labor they had to do. And they talked. Nobody else in the Netherlands talked, but they talked. You have a special rapport when you have um, patients and you try to put them at ease. And, and they, they talked and I realized what had been done. And then I wanted to know more about it and I, I read as much as I could. Mm -hmm. But really everything, uh, oh, not everything, nobody knows everything, but I learned most, of course, when I started volunteering at the Holocaust Museum in 1994. Mm -hmm. And every day there's something new that we find out. Yeah, and I've been amazed at how what you're still learning about your own personal story uh, to this day. Yes, absolutely. Louisa, I, I have one more question for you today, and that is, in the face of rising global anti-Semitism, tell us why you continue to share your firsthand account of what you and your family went through during the Holocaust? 
Right. So during the Holocaust, approximately 12 million people were murdered by the Nazis. Out of those 12 million, there were 6 million Jews. And out of those 6 million Jews, there were a million and a half innocent Jewish children. They had never done anything wrong in life. They were murdered because they were Jewish. And people let it happen. People stood by and did absolutely nothing. I want people to be aware what really happened. The Holocaust was genocide. And when you learn about it, you think that should never happen again. Never, never. But people didn't learn. It's still happening today. In late 70s, there's a genocide in Cambodia. 1992 in Bosnia. 1994 in Rwanda. And look in this age that we're living in now. Genocide in countries in Africa. There was genocide in the Middle East. And today still, the, the Uyghurs in China, there is a Muslim group that lives in China, they're being persecuted by the Chinese, and the Rohingya people in Burma. Mm -hmm. We cannot be silent. So if I tell you that a million and a half innocent children were murdered, and people didn't do anything, that is so horrendous. And when people learn that, my hope is that they will join me. I don't know how long I can still talk. I will talk till I can't talk anymore, but I need everybody's help. Mm -hmm. People need to speak up when they hear that there is something horrible going on. And you need to learn about it and then speak up. So the website of the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum uh, can keep you informed of what is going on in the world. And it can also help you and give you ideas what you can do. My advice is though, always do something together, do it with a group. For instance, if you have a bully in your school and that bully wants you to do something and you confront that bully by yourself, that bully doesn't wanna be confronted. He, will, he or she will bop you over the head and hurt you. But if you confront that bully as a group, yes, he or she has nothing more to say. You will succeed. So don't be silent. Tell people what happens when you don't respect other people, when people have a different religion than you have, different color skin, dress differently, have a different language. We need to respect each other and we need to help each other. And that's why I'm still speaking. If you've heard from me and people tell you the Holocaust never happened, you can say, but I heard it from somebody who was there. Yes, it did happen. That's why I'm still speak and I will speak till I can't speak anymore. Louisa, thank you so much. Uh, I, I, there's just so much that you shared with us, but one of the most compelling for me is give us, a, you gave us such an insight into that small world. You talked about the big world your parents had, the big life, and then you had that very small life but your parents did everything possible for that small world, that small life to be your normal life. Uh, that, that is just extraordinary. So thank you, thank you, thank you for that. Thank you very much, Bill. And thank you all for listening. And please do not forget, help. It should never happen again.